<laughs> Hello and welcome to Did You Know Gaming Extra. In this episode we'll be exploring trivia from a variety of games released for the original PlayStation. This was Sony's first true foray into the world of gaming consoles. Originally, Sony didn't intend to dive headfirst into the industry on their own and hoped that they'd be able to partner with already established game publisher Nintendo. Sony planned on supplying a peripheral to Nintendo's SNES system which would expand its capability with the use of compact disc technology. Despite not receiving any help from the creators of Mario though, Sony managed to build a massive gaming empire with a few mascots of their own. One of these mascots was Crash Bandicoot who had 5 whole games on the PS1, selling over 23 million units combined. Possibly the most praised Crash game, Crash 3 Warped, has an interesting easter egg hidden in plain sight. In the Egyptian themed levels there are hieroglyphs of a black dog on the walls. These markings are speculated to represent Morgan the Dog, a pet at Naughty Dog at the time. Morgan was also featured in a behind the scenes skit for the making of Crash 3, where the pupa infiltrates the studio. The remake of Crash Bandicoot 1 through 3, the Insane Trilogy, also kept this reference intact. Another massively popular franchise on the original PlayStation was the Final Fantasy series. The most popular of the PlayStation entries, Final Fantasy 7, managed to sell nearly 10 million copies on its own, just on the PS1. This was no doubt due to word of mouth and a solid marketing campaign. One of the advertisements for the game reads, Someone please get the guys who make cartridge games a cigarette and a blindfold. And... If it were available on cartridge, it would retail for around $1,200. This was an obvious jab at Nintendo in their cartridge-based system, the Nintendo 64, which was notoriously expensive to publish games for. In fact, part of the reason Square switched to Sony over Nintendo was because of the PS1's use of the much cheaper CD format. Some games for the PS1 were censored when brought to the West. One such game that was changed was Breath of Fire 4, most of its regional differences surrounding risque moments in the Japanese game. This includes a scene altered after the game's main protagonist, Ryu, places his hand on Ursula's chest. Rather than remove the scene, the character's reactions are altered instead. Ursula would be involved in another altered scene, during a moment where the player attempts to board a ship. To prove the team's value as crew on the ship, they are asked to spend a night on the ship to show their bravery. They are also told that misbehaving at sea will result in spanking, and that they'll have to show their backsides to prove their determination. Ursula then reveals a little more of her bold nature than the sailors had anticipated by dropping her pants. In the international release, the scene simply ends before this all takes place. Another scene that was cut entirely involves Ryu patiently keeping guard while the female party members bathe, though not holding back his temptation to snick a quick peek, to which he is shot at and called a pervert. Though nothing explicit is shown, the implication was likely considered too adult for a teen-rated title. This isn't the only game to have a change due to it revealing a little more than what Western audiences are used to. During the opening cinematic for the PlayStation release of Soul Blade, I'm really sorry, I don't know how the hell to say this name. Sophitia? 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 How to pronounce is the bet? Oh, they're all minus rated. Oh, Jesus Christ. Sophitia can be seen bathing in a large pool of water before being disturbed by a large statue emerging in front of her. In the international release, Sophitia is wearing a white bathing suit. However, in the game's original Japanese release, she is instead completely naked, covering herself as she stands up. A game with a different kind of revealing content is Silent Hill. Within the data of the game's demo, found on the demo disc number 16, published by the official US PlayStation magazine, are a number of unused placeholder images. These include several pieces of unused artwork, including the game's warning for grotesque imagery and early 3D renders for several of the game's characters. However, a few other curious images can also be found, some with notes from the developers themselves. Examples include a quote from Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, or more humorously, this image, which reads, I'm clueless when it comes to soft image. Just imagine there's an open book here, with a picture of a hunter, and a lizard with its mouth open wide. However, most surprising of all are two unused images for the game's menus. Firstly, the game's save load screen, which had a placeholder image of a fully nude woman lying on a hospital bed. And second, an image of six fully nude Japanese women which was used as a placeholder for the game's options menu. Unsurprisingly, these went unused and cannot be found on the disc of the game's retail release. One other title with hidden content which wasn't supposed to be seen by players, particularly with its intended audience in this case, was Rocket Power Team Rocket Rescue. Within the game's data are a number of messages with some unsavoury language, particularly when you take into account that the game is based on a children's cartoon show. These read, Foo. Too many vertices. Foo. Me break, Dre. Over the f***ing top. 
What the f*** are we doing here? Trying to load dude stuff. These images were used by the team during development rather than anything that would have been displayed to the user during gameplay. The action game 007 Tomorrow Never Dies also contains hidden content. Initially, the opportunity to develop the title was offered to game studio Rare, who had famously created the Nintendo 64 adaptation of GoldenEye. Although being given the chance to make a game on the next big Bond movie was tempting, the studio declined the offer. Instead, the opportunity was given to Black Ops Entertainment. Interestingly, hidden within the game's data is a photograph of a few members of the development team. Also within the data are several images making reference to a multiplayer mode, a very popular element of GoldenEye, despite not appearing in the final release of Tomorrow Never Dies. Another licensed game released on the original PlayStation was Star Wars Masters of Terras Cassie. The game's name, or more specifically Terras Cassie, is actually Finnish for Steel Hand. The term had never been used within the Star Wars films at the time, but instead first appeared in the Star Wars novel Shadow of the Empire, written by Steve Perry, part of the extended universe prior to Disney's acquisition. Perry came up with the name after looking for a certain kind of sound that he had in mind, Norse language having the kind of rhythm that he desired. Terras Cassie is a form of hand-to-hand -hand combat, which would be adopted into the new canon lore of the films with the release of Solo, a Star Wars story. Sith Lord Darth Maul, the leader of the Crimson Dawn, was an adept practitioner of the combat style, teaching it to Dryden Voss, who in turn trained his lieutenant, Kira. An interesting piece of lore that wasn't recognised in its first appearance on the PS1 can be found within Tekken 2. While fighting on Heihachi Mishima's stage, the Pagoda Temple, it's possible to see a carving on the ground. This carving is actually the names of both Heihachi and Kazumi, though it's hard to see this during regular gameplay. Kazumi, Heihachi's wife, was only ever alluded to once more after this in Tekken The Motion Picture, a two-part anime OVA adaptation of the series released in 1998. The film, which is considered to be non-canon, has a brief mention of Kazumi. Kazumi would finally be revealed in the official canon in Tekken 7, released in 2015 to Japanese arcades. This means that her inclusion in the Tekken universe was first alluded to in 1995, 20 years before her official debut. The strategy RPG game Kagiro Deception 2 has a character who makes a fairly hidden cameo. Deception 2 has a total of four different endings, and if a player has a save file with all four endings having been achieved, which is no small task mind you, a secret trap can be unlocked. The trap is actually a Suizo from the Monster Rancher series. When activated, the monster will fall from above and slam into adversaries. Another game with many secrets on the PS1 was Castlevania Symphony of the Night. The game, considered to be one of the best within the series, actually had several early ideas which never came to fruition. One of this was the consideration that, since the game takes place in Dracula's castle and Alucard would have once lived there, he would have his own room. The idea was to have the player be able to find Alucard's room at the top of the tower located to the right of the map. A character would have been found in this room known as the Skeleton Carpenter, and as the game progressed, the room would be built up with new furniture. There were thoughts of also including items and decorations throughout the game that the player could pick up and use to decorate the room to their liking. This feature was actually included in the game early on, but was ultimately cut. Another early idea for the game was to feature skeletons that would replace candles which the player breaks. Considered more as a joke, the staff thought that if they included these skeletons, killing them before they had a chance to run away would result in the candles never reappearing after they were destroyed. And now it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia. Today we're taking a look at Muteki Utrai Zenon, a Japanese exclusive Game Boy Color title developed by Marvelous Interactive. Within the game's data, though without any sort of explanation, is a list of all playable skaters from Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. The reason for this list's inclusion is even more confusing as Tony Hawk 2 for the Game Boy was created by Natsumi a year earlier. Patreon alert. Patreon alert. Patreon restarting. The free master game is genome restructuring. Confirming Robert Cox replacement. Base code 3223232. Its speed is overwhelming. Patreon to raise Trevor Woolton confirmed. Initializing Maximilian Summers. Processing. Disconnected. Activating emergency skunk starlight. Denied. Contamination is spreading wildly. Malcavio. Uh, don't look at me. Roger. Activating the shields. No good. 
Paul White second, they are attacking. We can't stop them. 98% of our weapons have taken over. Chad Bannon has been accessed. And its phase space logic is being rewritten. Everett Lafrop is increasing. Guillermo Chavez confirming transfer coordinate codes. Coordinate inputs, Jedistotl 7. Cairn 1111, the main planet. Damn, so they're planning on attacking. <clears throat> Your boy Beowulf. Activate artillery. Vitas Varnas, Clefairy. See that all Dojibir on Red and Corey Nelson are safely transported to the shuttles. I will send Hector Imarillo after everything is complete. I am blowing up the ship. All of you should probably leave. Thank you to Kadikaris for joining us for this episode. It was great to have you here. Good friend of the show, good personal friend of ours. Check out his channel. The link is in the description down below. And of course, thank you to our wonderful patrons and our wonderful viewers. Has anyone ever actually put the lime in the coconut and shaken it all up? because I, I bet it's good. <laughs>